Once upon a time, I was a one watch in, one watch out kind of guy. Not anymore. Things have got a little out of control. This is my watch collection. There are 10 of them. I hope you love them as much as I do. So a while back, about five years or so ago, I was just discovering Grand Seiko. Of course, the snowflake was all anyone would talk about, but for me back then, the price was a bit too strong to take a punt on. So when an SBG V245 popped up for sale for around a thousand pounds, I bought it. Literally the only pictures I'd ever seen of it were the ones in the advert, and it's utterly fantastic. The quality is exceptional. It feels like the whole thing has been milled from a single block of steel. And the quartz movement is great too. I changed the battery on it myself recently and it's a beautiful looking thing. Funny story, I did a video of that watch, but at the time it was a Japan only piece. I've been told by the guys at Grand Seiko UK that they got a lot of people asking for it because of that video, but they didn't have a single one to sell. Unlucky. This Tudor Black Bay 58 is the first watch that broke the one in one out policy. I'd been looking at it for literally years, but because it's not exactly inspiring, I could never commit to it. But I really missed my old Rolex Submariner, which I couldn't afford to rebuy, so I couldn't stop thinking about the 58. And the prices kept sneaking up, so eventually I bought one. By the old rules, the SBG V245, which I'd bought in the meanwhile, should have gone, but it was just so good I couldn't bear to part with it. So I kept both, and the floodgates were opened. Is the Tudor my favourite watch? No, it's kind of plain and boring, but then so am I, so that's probably why I like it. It's like a cheese and ham sandwich, you're never going to wow dinner guests with it, but sometimes you just really fancy a cheese and ham sandwich. My favourite thing about watches is probably the part I can least afford. Craftsmanship. I like nothing better than to look at a simple but well-finished movement. I have dreams of owning an Erlangenzona one day, but until that lottery win, I thought I'd have to stick to looking at pictures. Then I discovered pocket watches, chiefly the Hamilton 992B. This is a 1950s railroad watch, and it cost me somewhere in the region of £250. I was pining over it and Charlotte, my wife, told me to shut up already and get it. And I did. The dial was cracked and largely unattractive, but the movement. Oh my goodness, it's beautiful. And it's big, so I can see it. Striping, polishing, beveling, even on the wheels, to a level I'd only dreamt of owning. The crazy thing is the Americans made these things in their millions. Seriously, America used to be an absolute unit when it came to making very high quality watches at affordable prices. I actually swapped the screw down case back and front, so I can't actually tell the time with it, but I can easily enjoy the movement. This watch, the Casio F91W, is not only the one watch everyone in the world should own, it's the first watch purchased in tandem with Charlotte. One day she came home with two boxes and she said, pick one. Bemused, I did as instructed, and this was inside. The other had a teal version in, which she now has. It's the watch I wear for doing anything remotely rugged, and although it makes my wrist sweat like a vampire in Paris, I absolutely love it, because I knew from that day on that Charlotte was well and truly on board. So I mentioned the Erlangenzona. Very nice, very expensive. Classical, but different. High quality. All traits I couldn't afford. So when I had the opportunity to make a video on the Omi Watari, I realised there was an opportunity to enjoy all of these things at nothing like the cost of the Erlangenzona. The Omi Watari amalgamated a bunch of different things from other great Grand Seikos, like the slender case, hand-wound spring drive movement and simple dial, into the perfect package. And to me, it really is perfect. I've done a longer review on the channel of this watch before, link in the description, so I won't labour the point, but that icy blue dial, the slim elegant case and that smooth smooth glide from the Calibre 9R31 make this, I think, one of the best watches below £10,000. Oh hello, I didn't see you there. I was too busy enjoying all this fantastic new channel merch, and you can too. So if you want to be as cool as me, or perhaps even cooler, check it out just below the video. Thanks very much. So my unhealthy discovery of cheap pocket watches led me to a notion. If a beautifully finished pocket watch was readily attainable, what if I upped the ante to a complication? And when I say complication, 
What about an on-demand chiming complication? A repeater. Minute repeater wristwatches are practically the most complex and expensive you can get, so I knew the hope was a stretch. Anyway, turns out German Pelosin, creator of the insane Kopf watch and owner of Horological Underground, was also really good at sourcing unusual pocket watches. And he found this for me, a Jequier à Paris quarter repeater that's just about two centuries old. Now, repeater complications are pretty boring from the back as everything is dial side, so I asked German to remove the dial for me, which I have separately. And there you can see what makes this repeater extra special. It's chain driven. Depress the pusher and it all goes into motion, chiming the hours and quarters like it's not even 200 years old. I don't even wind it. I leave it at just before midnight, so every time I use the repeater, it always gives me the maximum chime. The next watch Charlotte and I bought together was the Moon Swatch. She really wanted one. I wasn't that bothered, but it didn't matter because they were unattainable. Anyway, Charlotte and I were in Geneva and we walked past the Swatch store and Charlotte suggested we had a look inside, just in case. I was very sceptical, but in we went anyway, and before we could even open our mouths, the shopkeeper gestured at the Tower of Moon Swatch boxes behind him and said, which one would you like? So Charlotte got a Jupiter and I got a Mars, and later on in the hotel we both marvelled at the awful quality, particularly the strap. So we both got a new strap each, and I'll be honest, it transformed the watch. Granted, the strap is also 15% of the watch's value, but there you go. Okay, so the pocket watch thing got really out of control when I discovered even more great American brands that made high quality movements for not very much money. This one, rather amusingly called Howard, is a lot smaller than the Hamilton and basically answered a question that I'd had about these pocket watch movements. Was the Hamilton only good because it was big? The Howard is getting towards a size that would fit in a wristwatch and I'll be honest, it's even nicer than the Hamilton. The bridge architecture, the finishing quality and the whole essence of this movement is what you'd expect from a Patek Philippe costing north of 20 to 30 thousand pounds. I'd been doing some research on these Howards and Charlotte very bravely decided to pick one to surprise me with for Christmas. Now I absolutely hate surprises, but Charlotte got it absolutely spot on. I think I got her a DVD or something. So barely a few months later and it's my birthday and we're mere weeks away from our first trip abroad to meet with collectors and do a live event. We were doing New York and then Seattle, seven hours away from home and then another six hours. I was a bit stupid actually, booking in the New York and Seattle events back to back, not realising how far apart they were, but apart from surviving on sliders and adrenaline, they were amazing. And what was even more amazing was that Charlotte gifted me a Casio A500 WEA for my birthday, a world timer. I wore it throughout the trip, especially when flying, and the world time function was genuinely useful and easy to use. Plus, I also looked like a high-flying business exec from the 1980s. Win-win. The other watch I wore on that trip was a prototype on loan from Christopher Ward. Now, usually when a watch comes in for review, I don't keep it for very long because there's not much time and security and all that, just long enough to get a good sense of a watch and its foibles. But when the 12 came in for a week, I told them I wouldn't be able to get it back in time before we left for America for a few weeks. So they said, that's fine, take it with you. So I did. They'd sent steel and titanium versions with bracelets and straps, and I picked out the titanium on rubber to wear. I was already impressed with the watch, but it just felt so comfortable to wear day to day and looked so good that by the time I got back, I couldn't help myself but ask to buy one. So I did, and here it is. I hope you enjoyed this. Which watch is your favourite and which would you ditch? If you want to see Charlotte's collection, let me know in the comments below. Please also like, subscribe and eat your next meal with only a spoon. And I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Still here? Watch this video next. <laughs>